Chapter 12, Sir Barnaby Paterne. The three older Pendlewick sisters agreed not to tell Geoffrey about owning Batty's soul and possible marriage. And Batty herself didn't discuss it with Geoffrey. On the other hand, Hound heard a great deal about the wedding and about how he would be the dog of honor. But since Hound was good at keeping Batty's secrets, Geoffrey didn't have to be troubled with the information. The boy was under enough strain as it was. It wasn't just the looming threat of military school and Dexter as a stepfather, or the now obvious disdain Mrs. Tipton had for the Penderwick girls, or even Jeffrey's first golf lesson at the country club, which would have made him hate golf more if he hadn't already hated it with all of his heart. It was also the garden club competition. Mrs. Tipton had discovered that judge was Mrs. Tipton had discovered that the judge was going to be that distinguished English gardener, Sir Barnaby Paterne. Mrs. Tipton could not bear to fail in the eyes of a man with Sir in front of his name. No, never, never. And so her obsession with the visit became a frenzy. She was even spotted once in shorts and sneakers, pulling up weeds and muttering to herself. It was not calming for Geoffrey and the Pendewicks. As much as they could, they stayed on the cottage side of the hedge, waiting impatiently. After all, the Pendewicks were leaving Arendelle at the end of the week until the garden club competition had come and gone. They shot lots of rubber tipped arrows. They practiced soccer. They even played hide and seek when desperate until finally the competition day itself arrived. Now all they had to do was stay away from the gardens for one more day, let Mrs. Tifton win her prize from Sir What's His Name and then they, everything would go back to normal. You're late. You're supposed to be here for breakfast, said Skye to Geoffrey who had just arrived. She and Jane were sitting on the cottage porch. We saved you some. Jane pointed to a plate of cold blueberry pancakes. I had to wait until I could sneak out of the house, said Geoffrey, pulling a pamphlet out of his pocket and handing it to Skye. Pensy Military Academy, where boys become men and men become soldiers, said Skye, reading from the pamphlet. Look at that poor kid. Jane pointed to a photograph of a young boy standing stiff as a ramrod in a tight blue military uniform. And check out the list of courses on the back, said Geoffrey. There's no music except for the brass marching band. I'd die there. Go nuts and die. Darn that Dexter. Double darn that lousy, rotten, no good creep, said Skye. Rosalind and Batty came out onto the porch just in time to catch the end of Skye's outburst. Talking about Dexter again, said Rosalind. Obviously, said Jane. Err, said Skye. I've been thinking, it's not that I mind going away to school, especially after Mother marries Dexter. Jeffrey shuddered. But why not send me where I'd be happy? I know a kid whose sister goes to boarding school in Boston just so she can take viola classes at the New England Conservatory of Music on Saturdays. I'd really like something like that. Jeffrey, you've simply got to talk to your mother about this, said Rosalind. How can I? Jeffrey cried out. She hasn't even told me about marrying Dexter yet. Her, Skye said again. Poor Jeffrey. Batty put her little hand on his cheek. Rosalind and I are going. Uh, Rosalind and I are going to hunt for dandelion leaves for Yaz and Carla because rabbits love dandelion leaves. Cagney says, "Come with us. It'll be fun." He can't," said Skye. "We need him for soccer." Another time, Batty cakes," said Jeffrey. Skye and Jane, make sure you stay on this side of the hedge for the next several hours," said Rosalind. Churchy called to remind us that the Garden Club people are arriving soon. You already told us that, said Skye. I'm telling you again, Daddy's keeping Hound inside with him at least until after lunch. We can't go into the gardens until we're sure those people are gone, okay? No one answered. Skye and Jane were studying the Pensy pamphlet and Geoffrey was moodily devouring cold blueberry pancakes. Rosalind raised her voice. Skye, Jane! Make sure you stay away from Arendelle Hall until the garden competition is over. And don't forget about being ladies or gentlemen or whatever. We know, Rosalind, said Jane. Really, we do, said Geoffrey. We've been good for days, said Skye. We wouldn't be silly enough to mess it up now. Because Mrs. Tifton, said Rosalind, we'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Come on, Rosalind, Batty tugged at her hand. We promised Cagney and Rosalind let Batty pull her away. Listen, said Jane, her nose still in the pamphlet. At Pensy, we build strong moral character through hard work, strict discipline, and rigorous physical activity. 
I can't stand any more of that. Jeffrey snatched the pamphlet and threw it onto the porch. Let's play soccer. It was Skye's turn to pick the drill. She chose two-on-one slaughter, a combination of cross-country running, guerrilla warfare, and monkey in the middle, perfect for rough terrain like the land around the cottage with all of its trees and long grasses. It was even better with two balls, which they now had, as Mr. Pendewick had repaired the one bitten by hound. Jeffrey's ball had been christened Dexter days ago. Now Skye spat on the other one, officially naming it Pensy Military Academy, and kicked it into the air. Two-on-one slaughter had begun. Jeffrey was a wild man that day, attacking the balls with a fury the other two had not yet seen. He gained control of the Pensy ball every chance he got and slammed it into trees, over rocks, anything he could find, until the girls thought the ball would explode. Not that Skye was all that civilized. Her blood was boiling over Jeffrey's possible fate, and while she couldn't punish Dexter for his part in it, she certainly could punish the Dexter ball. But Jane was the worst of the three. The combination of worry about Jeffrey and two-on-one slaughter brought out her most aggressive side, so much so that she needed to become someone a lot tougher than herself, tougher even than Sabrina Starr, to get through it. That's where Mick Hart came in. Mick Hart, the oh-so-talented center for Manchester, England, dreamt up by Jane six months earlier after a terrible game in which she was pummeled by a fullback twice her size. When Jane was Mick, she felt no pain. She could maneuver around any fullback on the face of the earth. She was adored by fans and teammates alike, and she had a big mouth. The big mouth was Jane's favorite part. Fish head, she shouted over and over. Knave, churl. For a while, Skye was working too hard to care about the insults. Tripped by a jutting tree root, she fumbled, ended up as the monkey without a ball, then had to struggle mightily to intercept either Dexter or Pensy as they whizzed up her whizzed by her again and again. But Jane and Jeffrey were both at the top of their game and the balls eluded her and her frustration grew. What's the matter, Skye? taunted Jeffrey, neatly kicking, kicking Dexter over her head to Jane. Not a thing, Skye spun around, just missing Pensy as it zipped past on its way to Jeffrey. Gooseberry louse, shouted Jane with great glee. Silly git. Finally, that was too much. Being called a fish head is one thing but no one can stand being called a silly git by her younger sister, even when she doesn't know what a git is. Skye tossed away all the rules, not that there were many rules, and faked a bad fall to the ground. Jane hesitated, sisterly love overcoming Mick Hart's ferocity for a split second, and Skye, laughing demonically, was suddenly on her feet and throwing herself at Pensy. She walloped the ball toward Jeffrey. Jane's the monkey! she shouted triumphantly. Again, they were off. Dashing, darting, weaving, panting, Skye and Jeffrey passed Dexter and Pensy back and forth between them, and again and again and again. Jane, shouting, whooping, threatening, made dive after dive until finally inspired, she made a stunning leap into the air and stopped Dexter with a textbook foot trap. Now Jeffrey was the monkey. He positioned himself between the two sisters, determined to get back into the game but Jane and Skye were suddenly the perfect team. On and on they dribbled through the trees, exchanging the two balls with precision passes, keeping them away from him. It was two on one slaughter at its best. Even Jeffrey in his fury could see that, but he wasn't going to let it on. He decided to ignore the balls that kept whizzing past his feet and charged straight at Skye. Skye, danger, shouted Jane, lobbing Dexter high into the air. Skye saw Jeffrey coming at her and booted Pensy after Dexter. Up flew the two balls together, higher and higher and higher, while below them the players charged forward. Then, just when it seemed the balls would keep going until they reached the sky, Pensy and Dexter paused, hovered, and began their slow, graceful descent over the top of the hedge and into the gardens. Did anyone think then about the Garden Club competition? Did anyone hesitate, vaguely remembering what they'd been told over and over to stay out of the gardens that day? Nope, no one thought or hesitated, not for an instant. Frantic and bloodthirsty savages, all three, zoomed to the tunnel and piled through with Jane yelling war cries for everyone. Come to me, Pensy Ball, come 
into Mick. Up, Penderwicks, down, Dexter. And once through, when they still had a chance to save themselves, did anyone listen for the approaching murmur of voices? Did anyone notice the glimpses of color moving along behind the rose arbor? Did anyone do anything sensible at all? Again, no. They had ears only for Jane's shouting and eyes only for the soccer balls landing, still in perfect synchronization in front of the marble thunderbolt man, then bouncing and bouncing again, heading directly for the urn where Skye had hidden on her first day, an urn now full of glorious, lush, blooming pink jasmine. Toward the urn, the three children raced in a dead heat, Jane still shouting, for Churchill, Nelson, and Prince William. Faster they ran and faster until finally, magnificently, all three players had both balls smashed into the urn at exactly the same moment, splattering jasmine and dirt in all directions before collapsing to the ground in one glorious, ecstatic, and very dirty mess. Now that was a game of two-on-one slaughter, breathed Jane with great satisfaction. Amen, said Geoffrey. Skye was the only one to sense the approaching danger. Maybe, she said this later, it was because she was the OAP. Or maybe she at long last remembered the garden club, but for whatever reason, some instinct made her turn her head. High heels is what she saw. A pair of navy blue high heels and a little higher up a white pleated linen skirt with a bit of crushed pink jasmine clinging to the hem. That wasn't all. Next to the high heels was a man, a pair of man's leather loafers, much too classy, too European for Dexter to wear. And still, that wasn't all, for behind the high heels and loafers were yet more high heels, a whole platoon's worth of high heels, a whole army's worth. Jeffrey, Sky spoke softly, but with great urgency. He was too busy poking Jane to pay attention. What is a git anyway? A git is, Jeffrey, said Skye again, staring helplessly at the hordes of advancing shoes. Jane, a thoroughly useless person. Isn't it a great word? I found it in Daddy's Oxford English Dictionary. Jane put on Mick Hart's thick accent. I say, that bloke Dexter is most definitely a... Skye slapped her hand over Jane's mouth. Hello, Mrs. Tifton, she said in a desperate display of bravado. How's the competition going? There had been bad moments at Arendelle, and there were more to come, but the total badness of this moment lived in the girls' memories for a long time. They and Geoffrey untangled themselves and struggled to their feet, feeling like they were about to face a firing squad, one that had every right to shoot them. For they were completely in the wrong, and whatever anger and punishment the firing squad, that is Mrs. Tifton, wanted to mete out, they deserved it. Yet when they were upright and facing Mrs. Tifton, she didn't say the terrible things she must be thinking. Her face was dreadful to see. The fury, humiliation, and frustration, it was all there, but she was silent. For this was all in her face too, that if she tried to speak, she would yell. And if she yelled, she wouldn't be able to stop yelling, which absolutely could not happen in front of Sir Barnaby Patern and the garden club it was an epic struggle for Mrs. Tifton, and Skye and Jane would almost feel sorry for her if they weren't too busy being frightened. Then someone chuckled. It was a man's chuckle, and everybody looked away from Mrs. Tifton and toward Sir Barnaby. To their surprise, he had quite a nice face, with a friendly smile and lots of laugh wrinkles all around his eyes. My son plays football, your soccer, you know, at his school in England. Too bad I didn't bring him along. He turned to Mrs. Chif Tifton. Are these charming children yours? He had made it worse, and the Penderwicks were still debating years later whether or not he'd done it on purpose. Mrs. Tifton's conflict became visibly so much more painful that Skye was afraid she'd explode right there. Then for the first time, Skye felt a fleeting twinge of admiration for the woman, as somehow she pulled herself together and she turned calmly to Sir Barnaby. Jeffrey is my son. The girls are, she stopped, unable to find a polite enough word. Friends, said Jeffrey, Skye and Jane Penderwick. We're renters, said Jane, mere renters at the cottage here at Arundel, 
and that is our, our father is the renter and we are two of his four daughters and we're awfully sorry about this mess but I was wondering if being English and therefore from England you've you've ever seen a World Cup Skye kicked Jane to silence her we should go we'll clean up the jasmine first leave it said Mrs. Tipton sharply her self-control was almost gone well, good luck with the competition, Mrs. Tifton. It was nice meeting you, Sir Patern, and hello to all of you. Skye nodded to the rest of the garden club, some of whom, she was relieved to see, looked as though they were trying not to laugh. Come on, Jane. But Jane, in her panic, was still staring at Sir Barnaby. He was the least scary adult person, besides being English and therefore fascinating, and hadn't, and hadn't heard a word. In the end, Skye had to take her hand and drag her away. They waved to Geoffrey as they went, hoping they weren't leaving him to be maimed or murdered or worse. Feeling the eyes of thousands of, feeling the eyes of thousands boring into their backs, they ran like the wind to the tunnel, ducked and scuttled to safety. If Skye could have kicked herself at the same time, she would have. What fools they'd been to forget about the garden club competition. Silly fools, silly, silly. Do you think Mrs. Tifton and all the other people heard that stuff I shouted? asked Jane. It was evening of the same day and she and Skye were once again sitting on the cottage porch. On the lawn in front of them, Rosalind and Batty were chasing fireflies. Are you nuts? People in Connecticut must have heard you, said Skye. Jane groaned. Oh, I hope we didn't get Jeffrey into too much trouble. Ha! Skye knew there was no chance Jeffrey wasn't in lots of trouble. Batty ran up, her hands cupped together. I caught one named Horatio, she said, and spread open her hands. A lightning bug balanced uncertainly on her thumb. Look, he's blinking, said Jane. He's trying to tell us something in Morse code. What? asked Batty. Please let me go, said Jane. The bug flew away. Now I can't put him in a jar with the other ones, said Batty. Good, said Jane. Let's play something else. How about circus acrobats? Across the yard, Rosalind unscrewed the lid of Batty's jar and watched the imprisoned lightning bugs bump their way to freedom. When the last one took flight, she had a sudden weird crawly feeling on the back of her neck. As she later wrote to Anna, it wasn't like spiders or lightning bugs that you want to brush away. It was more like the soft touch of fate's fingers announcing the arrival of something or someone special. Rosalind stood up. Walking toward her through the soft evening light was a tall, smiling young man wearing a baseball cap. He looked, if possible, even more adorable than the last time she'd seen him. Hi, Cagney, she said, and tried to screw the lid onto the jar backward. Here, let me. Cagney secured the lid with a quick twist. I've got a message for your sisters. They're on the porch. As Rosalind walked across the lawn beside him, she lengthened her stride to match his and noted that the top of her head barely reached his shoulder. On the porch, Batty was upside down, balancing on her hands while Jane held her ankles. Skye saw Cagney and Rosalind approach. Any news about Geoffrey? He's been in his room all afternoon and has to stay there till morning, said Cagney. He asked me to come over and tell you he's fine. Did Miss, does Mrs. Tifton have him on bread and water? Asked Jane. No. Churchy's got him on hamburgers, corn on the cob, and blueberry pie. Is he locked in? Does he have enough books to read? Jane paused while Skye whispered in her ear. Oh, good idea. Rosalind, we're going for a walk. She handed Batty's ankles over to Rosalind and jumped off the porch with Skye. Don't be long, it's getting dark, said Rosalind as they melted away into the trees. Nice kids, said Cagney. For their age. Oof, said Batty, still upside down. Looks like we might finally get some rain, Cagney said. The gardens sure need it. There hasn't been any rain at all since we got here, said Rosalind. Woof, said Batty. Oh, I forgot about you. I'm right here. I know you are. I'm sorry. Rosalind gently lowered Batty to the floor. Why don't, why don't you go get the surprise for Cagney? Batty scampered inside. She was back in a minute with a big plastic bag stuffed full of dandelion grains. Rosalind and I porridged these for Yaz and Carla. Foraged, said Rosalind. But Batty meant, ba but Batty, I meant the other surprise, the one we got in town with Daddy yesterday. Oh, that. Batty went inside again. This time she came back with a gift-wrapped package that she handed to Cagney. This is because I let Yaz escape. 
I wanted to get you the rabbit calendar, but Rosalind said you'd like this better. She used up her allowance for the next two months on it. She'd already spent all her, since she'd already spent all of her money on Jeffrey's present. Shh, said Rosalind. A book of Civil War ph photographs, said Cagney, tearing off the wrapping paper. What a wonderful surprise, but you didn't have to. Yes, we did. You know, I think Batty did Yaz a favor. He stopped trying to escape all the time. He won't even go near the door. But thanks, Rosalind, this was very thoughtful. Let's catch more lightning bugs, said Batty. It's time for you to get ready for bed, said Rosalind. I'll be up there in a few minutes for a story. I need a bath first. You just had one last night. My feet are dirty again. Batty slid one foot out of its sandal and held it up between Rosalind and Cagney. It was indeed dirty. Okay, you need a bath, said Rosalind. Ask Daddy to run the water for you and I'll be inside soon to help with the rinsing and the drying. I want you to run the water. Rosalind glanced at Cagney. He was paging through his new book, holding it close to his eyes to see the pictures in the fading light. She gave him until she gave him until the count of three to look away from the Civil War and over at her. One, two, three. She sighed and said, We have to go inside now, Cagney. Good night. Only then did he look at Rosalind. Good night, and thanks for the book and the dandelions. Rosalind took Batty's hand and led her into the house. I still think he would have liked that rabbit calendar better, said Batty. Thank goodness Cagney installed a rope ladder, said Jane to Skye. They were underneath the big tree outside Jeffrey's room, and Skye was untying a length of twine from a nail hammered into the tree trunk. Jeffrey showed me how it works the other day. This twine is keeping the ladder rolled up in the tree. You undo the knot, let go of the twine, and the ladder falls down. There's another knot up at the top if someone's trying to get down instead of up. Ouch! The ladder had fallen on Jane's head. You weren't supposed to stand right under it. You could have told me that before. Climb. They clambered to the top of the rope ladder and eased themselves carefully onto the lowest tree branch, the one where they had gotten stuck their first week at the cottage. Jane looked straight up. The daylight was gone and thick clouds were hiding the moon and the stars. All she could see were the black branches against an almost black sky. Scared to climb in the dark, said Sky. Fear never stops, Sabrina Star. When we get further up, we'll have, to, we'll have the light from Jeffrey's window. Sky pointed to a rectangle of light high up in the house. Hark, I hear music. Sky tipped her head to listen. It's Jeffrey. The boy poured his misery and loneliness into his beloved piano, said Jane. Good line, she thought but too late for my book. She'd already begun Sabrina Starr's rescue scene, complete with bow and arrow, and there was no way Arthur could take a piano along on that hot air balloon ride. Of course, she could go back and add the misery and loneliness line to a previous chapter, but Jane hated to revise. She believed in sticking with her original creative vision. Climb, said Skye. Slowly and carefully, they hauled themselves up the tree higher and higher until they reached the branch outside Jeffrey's window. They peered into his room. He was sitting plump, slumped on the piano stool, no longer playing, just staring into space. Psst, said Jane. He jumped up and ran to the window. What are you doing here? Cagney said you were okay, but we felt guilty. We wanted to see you. We're really sorry, said Skye. It was idiotic to forget about the competition. It wasn't, it wasn't your job to remember, said Jeffrey. I live here. I guess so, but if we had been distracting you, especially Jane, with pretending she was Mick Hart. Honest, it's okay. It's not okay. Skye pulled the Pensy pamphlet out of her pocket and handed it to Jeffrey. Anyway, you left this on the porch. I should have thrown it down the toilet, said Jeffrey. Can you come inside? We'd better not, said Skye. It's late and Daddy will be looking for us soon. What did your mother say to you after all those people left? asked Jane. She said, she yelled, all about how I don't care about her feelings anymore. I do care. She's my mother. We know, said Jane. Then she found out Arendelle got second place in the competition and then she yelled at me all over again. Mrs. Robinette got first place, said Jeffrey. That really killed my mother. She kept talking about me needing more discipline. She didn't say anything about going to Pensy this year, did she? Said Skye. No, but she hinted that she and Dexter have a lot to talk about tonight. That doesn't sound good. Jeffrey turned his head, listening. I hear someone coming. You'd better go. See you in the morning, said Jane. 
at the cottage, said Jeffrey. Do or die.